Hello, and welcome to Game Theory. I'm Professor Naomi Utgoff of the United States Naval Academy. In this video, we'll use the tools we've developed in the past several videos to study Stackelberg Duopoly, a dynamic duopoly game. Loosely speaking, Stackelberg's game is Cournot Duopoly with some timing added. Two firms select quantities sequentially rather than simultaneously. Here are the extensive and tree forms of Stackelberg Duopoly. The firms produce identical goods. Firm 1, called the leader or a Stackelberg leader, selects its quantity Q1 first. Firm 1's action, once taken, is common knowledge. Firm 2 observes Q1. Firm 1 knows Firm 2 observes Q1. Firm 2 knows Firm 1 knows Firm 2 observes Q1, etc. This tree looks a little bit different from the trees we've seen up to this point. Instead of finitely many actions at each move, Stackelberg's game features infinitely many actions at each move. We represent these action spaces by drawing a single node with a wedge and labeling the wedge with the action space. Since Firm 1 has infinitely many actions, Firm 2, in fact, has infinitely many moves, despite the tree's depiction of just one wedge for Firm 2. We can't possibly draw infinitely many wedges, so we place a single node on the arc of Firm 1's wedge and let that signify that Firm 2 moves after Firm 1. Backwards induction proceeds as usual, from the end of the game to the beginning. Given the infinite number of moves and action spaces, we need a more powerful method than individually selecting the best action at each move. We'll use calculus to accomplish both of the steps listed here to complete backwards induction. We will take care of backwards induction at all of Firm 2's moves at once. This step is identical to Firm 2's problem in Cournot Duopoly. Firm 2's problem in Stackelberg Duopoly does backwards induction at all of Firm 2's moves in one fell calculus swoop, because the result of this step is the action that maximizes Firm 2's profit as a function of Firm 1's Q1. Let's tidy up the objective function a bit. Go ahead and use this step to distribute Q1 if you like. We take the partial derivative of pi 2 with respect to q2 and set it equal to 0. This expression determines q2 star as a function of q1. Our, or at least my, old friend the product rule produces this derivative. As in Cournot duopoly, we change q2 to q star at this point to indicate that rather than any old q2, we now have the profit maximizing q2 star. Distribute and collect like terms. Next, move q2 star to the left-hand side of the equation. q2 star equals 120 minus q1 all over 2. This function describes firm 2's strategy. It tells us the action firm 2 takes as a function of firm 1's action. Since the function tells us an action at each of firm 2's moves, this function is exactly firm 2's strategy. If firm 1 produces 20, Firm 2 chooses Q2 star equal to 120 minus 20 all over 2, which is 50. If Firm 1 produces 120, Firm 2 chooses Q2 star equal to 120 minus 120 all over 2, which is 0. You can pick the Q1 of your choice and apply this formula to obtain the appropriate Q2 star. Now that we've found Firm 2's strategy, we move up the tree to determine Firm 1's strategy. Firm 1's problem, in which Firm 1 anticipates Firm 2's response when selecting Q1, is where the solutions of Stackelberg and Cournot duopoly diverge. Firm 1's anticipation of Firm 2's response means mathematically that Firm 1 maximizes its profit subject to constraint by Firm 2's response. Substitute the constraint into the objective function. Next, do some algebra to clean up the objective function. Now, some more algebra to clean up the objective function. Here is Firm 1's problem, all tidied up. Now, we'll use calculus to find Q1 star. We take the derivative of pi 1 with respect to Q1 and set it equal to 0. This expression determines Q1 star. Once again, our friend the product rule to the rescue. Clear the denominators, and solve for q1 star. We're at the top of the tree, so backwards induction is done. 
Yay! The results of steps one and two specify the unique subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of this Stackelberg game. Using the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium strategies, we see that the corresponding path of play is firm one produces 60 and firm two produces 30. Let's give some intuition for these quantities. If one of these firms simply vanished into thin air, the remaining firm would become a monopolist and produce the monopoly quantity, 60 in this market. The Stackelberg leader produces its monopoly quantity. The intuition here is that the Stackelberg leader chooses its quantity before any action by the second firm, i.e. at the time of the leader's action, it is, however momentarily, a monopolist. After the leader's move, there are some remaining consumers who would still, at some price, buy the good. We call the demand from these consumers the residual demand. The second firm goes second and last, so it is a monopolist with respect to the residual demand. The second, following firm, chooses its monopoly quantity with respect to the residual demand. In this market, 30. We've found the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, an equilibrium path of play in Stackelberg duopoly, and interpreted the game and players as a sequence of monopolists. Now, we'll compare Stackelberg and Cournot duopoly, since they are both games in which competing firms select quantities. First, let's look at the games side by side. On the left, we have the extensive form of Stackelberg duopoly, and on the right, we have the normal form of Cournot duopoly. We see that the only distinction between the two is that moves in Stackelberg duopoly are sequential and moves in Cournot duopoly are simultaneous. Hence, the interpretation, loosely, that Stackelberg duopoly is Cournot duopoly with timing. Here, we have the subgame perfect Nash equilibrium of Stackelberg duopoly next to the best response functions of Cournot duopoly. While the former is in equilibrium and the latter is not, it is good to put them side by side to see how the result of solving Firm 2's problem is identical in both games, while the timing of Stackelberg duopoly changes Firm 1's decision problem. In this last slide, let's look at the equilibrium path of play in Stackelberg duopoly next to the Nash equilibrium quantities of Cournot duopoly and make a few observations. First, the leader produces more in Stackelberg duopoly than it would have in Cournot, while the follower produces less. Second, the total output in Stackelberg duopoly exceeds the total output in Cournot duopoly. The comparison is somewhat more nuanced in the asymmetric case, which appears in the homework. Finally, the Cournot-Nash equilibrium quantities are also in Nash equilibrium in Stackelberg duopoly, albeit not subgame perfect, since they are mutual best responses. However, the Cournot-Nash equilibrium quantities do not form a subgame perfect Nash equilibrium, since firm 1 cannot credibly commit to producing 40, and firm 2 cannot credibly threaten to produce 40. As soon as firm 1 produces 60, firm 2 will back down and produce 30. Thanks so much for watching this video about Stackelberg duopoly. In the next video, we'll introduce our first game of infinite depth and learn how to use stationarity to adapt backwards induction to find Nash equilibria in infinite depth games.